Anyone who has spent time outdoors probably has a snake story to share. As a child, I would often cut through the grass field between my house and my cousin's house to go play with them. On one occasion, when I was cutting through the tall grass, I remember hearing the rattle before I saw the rattlesnake. I knew enough to keep my distance, and in fact, I'm pretty sure I turned around and ran like mad back to my house, canceling my play date for the day. Rattlesnakes often strike fear in the hearts of some people, but they shouldn't. Knowing a little about how these reptiles behave and doing a few simple things can go a long way in keeping you and the snake safe and will allow you to appreciate the important role they play in our ecosystems. This is WILD, a Utah Division of Wildlife Resources podcast. I'm your host, Faith Heaton Jolly, and this is episode 30, Rattlesnakes of Utah. Welcome back to WILD. We are here in studio today for this month's episode. I am here with two of our employees for the division. Drew Dittmer is our native species coordinator and herpetologist. And Scott Gibson is our wildlife conservation biologist for our southeastern region. So he just made the trek today, come into Salt Lake for this. I did, yes. A special trip, Uh and we appreciate him for it. So for both of you, obviously... Those are fancy titles. Kind of break down what it is that you do for the division in those positions and how long you've worked here. Let's maybe start with Scott. Sure. So I, I've i been here for about five and a half years. So I started back in 2016. And so my fancy title is just basically a lot of words for a non-game biologist. So I, I deal with all the terrestrial species in the southeastern region that are not hunted, essentially. So birds and mammals. Unfortunately, reptiles and amphibians don't fall to me, but because of my background in herpetology, then I'm sort of the de facto herpetologist oftentimes in our region. So I love it. I know I asked that. I was like, wait, you're wildlife. Why are you talking about reptiles and snakes right. and... Well, I mean, you're, you're a jack of all trades. Birds are basically reptiles. <laughs> so it's. That's fair. I was wondering yeah. how long it was going to take. Not very long. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. We just went there. Okay. And then, Drew, how about you? So uh, I started in October of 2018, basically hired to be a herpetologist. But in Utah, the state agency puts all reptile and amphibian issues in the aquatic section. So. Uh, even tortoises and gila monsters are all in the aquatic section. It's just a division, a cut we made before I started. And this isn't that weird. Um, a lot of state agencies either like lump amphibians in the aquatic sections or give those issues to aquatic sections. Like in the eastern states, a lot of fish biologists end up being turtle biologists just because like they're in similar habitats. So it's just where where I landed. And also I'm interested in fish as a side thing. Nice. Um, so happy to be in the aquatic section. Awesome. Um, So today's topic is kind of interesting. We wanted to talk about rattlesnakes. It's kind of something that I think has a lot of mystery around it, right? (laughs) A lot of misconceptions, a lot of kind of weird folklore and kind of incorrect perceptions. So we wanted to kind of dive into a lot of that today with our two resident experts here. So the first question, and as I've learned, there's never a simple, clear-cut answer for most of these. I'm glad you led with that. That's, yes. That is the most accurate thing you could say about not just herpetology, but most wildlife, wildlife science, wildlife biology, ecology, all that stuff. Sure. Just biology, basically. There aren't really very many concrete answers. Sure. They're all context-driven. Right. So I preface that because most of my kind of questions are like, very simple, right? And so you guys will kind of explain how it's not such a simple answer. So to start, obviously we know we do have rattlesnakes here in the state of Utah. So how many different rattlesnake species do we have? So we have five species that are recognized within the state. And then I'll let Drew kind of expand on that a little bit. But depending on if you're a lumper or a splitter in terms of how you want to classify them, there could be less or there could be more. I tend to kind of err more on the splitting side with rattlesnakes, but yeah, that's that's kind of where, where I'm at with that. But I'll let Drew kind of take that. He knows a little bit more about... The systematics of rattlesnakes? Yeah. Oh boy, I'm going to get in trouble when uh-huh. uh, when a, one of those university rattlesnake researchers hears <laughs> right. me weigh in on it. That's why I uh, dished it to you. Yeah, sure. I understand. 
Yeah, so we, we recognize five on our web page for the most part, but we also have another subspecies we recognize in our wildlife action plan that I wanted to mention, the midget faded rattlesnake. And that's just a little side note, but that's because midget faded rattlesnake can receive special protections under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because it's recognized subspecies. So we pull it out for special conservation recognition to track its conservation status and make sure it's doing okay and we're keeping it off of the list. Gotcha. That being said, Utah is a western state that sort of borders, it borders like the northern Rockies and blends all the way into the southwest. Like it's on a border that transitions those two broad regions of the western U.S. And especially right around Grand Canyon in the Four Corners area, things get complicated with rattlesnakes um, because there's a bunch of different species that come together and they have different appearances. They, they look different from one another, whether they're on the bottom of the canyon or at the top of the canyon or the kind of soil that they live on. And so this is where you can get into the splitter world, which I'm not even going to go <laughs> in there and tell you how many species there are or are not, because it will immediately enter into like opinions that pe- sure. people will disagree with me. With Dr- me Drew's but, hot takes. Yeah. yeah. That being said, there may be as many as eight in Utah, I'm okay. comfortable saying. And Five is pr- probably the low, as low as it gets. Okay. So, when you say a subspecies, like for someone that's not a bio, just sure. as myself, explain how that works. Like, so, what so does that mean? So there are species concepts that biologists use to try to articulate what a species is, which is still an open question, right? This is not a resolved question in the world of biology. We're really close. Like, there's some things we really know what they are like white-tailed deer. And right. even then, like, there's people that are way in on subspecies for white-tailed deer. I won't go there. But, like, we're pretty confident what a white-tailed deer is. Sure. But species are dynamic things, and there's a lot of things where we haven't even been investigating them that long. And so what they are is still an open question. And we even learn things by looking at their genetics, looking at their appearance, looking at their location on the landscape and how isolated they are from other populations. All of that affects what a species is described as. Meaning it's not likely to be kind of a mix of two different types or something. Yeah, and and like hybridization is one way that species happen, but it's not the most common way by any stretch. Okay. Um, And so like the midget faded rattlesnake, for example, it's a subspecies. So it was described as a full species. I can't even remember the year, but it was described from a specimen collected by the Henry Mountains in Utah by a curator of the herb collection at the University of Utah named Angus Woodbury. And he described it as Crotalus concolor, the midget faded rattlesnake. At the exact same time, someone else described it as Crotalus daycolor, and I can't remember that individual's name. Yeah. They described it at the exact same time, each individual. They like both discovered They both this discovered new. it and wrote a paper and saying like they gave it this name. And so it was unresolved just because of this conflict in taxonomy sure. for a long time. Who gets the credit for this find? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so anyway, a, a subspecies, maybe to be more simple about it, is often a distinct population on the landscape that has, to most eyes, a different appearance from the rest of the population. It's not so drastically different that you would call it a different species, but it looks different enough that you kind of know where that one was from on the landscape. Interesting. So, so it's usually specific to an area. Yeah, like I'm trying to think of a non-herp example, but I'm such a you're, deeply ingrained herp herpetologist. I know. Yeah. And so like a, a famous one for me personally is the uh, Lizards in White Sands National Monument in New Mexico. Lizards on White Sands National Monument are very white. <laughs> like they're bleached and they match oh. the substrate. And it's a heritable trait. They're born that way. They don't... They don't Camouflage turn white later or in, in their development or anything. They're, they're born with this trait. And so many people describe them as a subspecies of the other lizards that they're related to, which the moment you move off of White Sands National Monument, you can find the same species, but it's a darker form. It's, it's on darker soil. It's they darker. They look different. And so you can, the moment you see that lizard, you, you can know that, like, you have a fence lizard from White Sands National Monument. It looks like a fence lizard, shaped like a fence lizard. All the scales look like a fence lizard, but it's white. Mm. <laughs> You're like, okay, I know where that one's from. And so that's often how, at least in herpetology, subspecies are right. play, played out. And to play the devil's advocate to what Drew's saying, in the ornithological world mm. with birds, oftentimes subspecies are not nearly as distinctive yeah so like willow flycatchers we have 
several subspecies and they all look the same they all they, <laughs> yes they all look the same this one has a sneezy fits view when it makes a call versus this one which is yeah i mean it's very difficult interesting yeah you have to really be like paying attention and yeah, kind of nerding out or to genetic know. work yeah interesting yeah. okay so. so five to maybe eight different rattlesnake species depending on how nerdy you get with it i guess so kind of talk about what rattlesnakes eat what's their food source and you said I'm this. mostly going to look at Scott and, and then res, like play off of him right. because I'm the one that, and I've seen Scott talk at great length and like, I know he can go nuanced, but sometimes I think I might even be worse. So some, oh I, <laughs> I, know, I know anybody listening to this is like, Scott's a big nerd. So <laughs> it's just, I mean, you it must really be, be a big nerd. Maybe a nerd off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So rattlesnakes eat a lot of different things and it's, there's not any one specific thing that you can say, this is what rattlesnakes eat. And it really depends on the species. It depends on what habitat they're in. And it's really going to be limited by the size of the prey that they can consume based on the size of their mouth. Right. Oh, and, gotcha. and so many people know this idea that snakes, oftentimes you hear snakes can unhinge their jaw and they can eat prey that is way bigger than their, their head, which is sort of true. I mean, they don't really unhinge it. There's I won't get too technical in it, but basically there's bones that, and other four-legged animals, and it sounds weird to say snakes as a four-legged animal, but they're considered to be quadrupeds. So we kind of group them in with other... Tetrapods. Tetrapods. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, tetrapods. Thank you, Drew. Nerd. (laughs) Score score one They're not quadrupeds. They are tetrapods. Um, And so the quadrate bone is kind of what what does it all. And the quadrate bone in, in a lot of other animals, it's fused into the skull, which really makes that that jaw Im- immobile and in rattlesnakes and snakes in general um, that quadrate bone is free and so it it allows the jaw to open up a lot more and then they can um, their mandibles really aren't fused it just kind of has like a real real soft ligament in the front that can kind of stretch way out and so they can eat prey that's considerably larger than their head but it ultimately is going to be limited by the size of the snake and so typically speaking you're talking about with most rattlesnake species as adults they're going to eat rodents so squirrels you know mice chipmunks things like that do they on... eat stuff as big as like a rabbit yes it can happen if the snake's big enough i mean uh, okay. scott may have observed this i don't know but a snake can eat something too big for it it can get its head around it and swallow it and it can die later because it ate something too big for its internal like organs it... to keep up with oh wow yeah i've actually seen it this literally on... can't digest it yeah. yeah so i did research on eastern massasauga rattlesnakes um in some of my postgraduate work and they're a small rattlesnake species and the babies so we were actually we would we would collect pregnant females which will talk about later because it's actually pretty cool they give birth to live young so we would collect these and they'd give birth in the lab and then we'd get all kinds of morphometrics so measurements on like weight and length and stuff like that on the babies and then and these are tiny i mean they would be like you know six seven grams in weight which is you know not much more Mm -hmm. than a nickel and we had one that we um, discovered one time out that was relatively recently born and it had a shrew that it had consumed and the, the shrew it was dead, and the snake and the shrew. And the shrew, we, we pulled it out and weighed the shrew, and I think it was like 10 or 11 grams, and oh, the snake wow. itself was like six. Wow. So, I mean, it's there is a size limit. Literally bit off more than it could chew. Yeah. yeah, and so there's more and more research where they put, like, cameras filming snakes in the wild where they're sit to ambush for their prey. And as that footage emerges, you start to see and get the impression that snakes are actually very considerate <laughs> about like <laughs> what they're going to eat because you have to think about it from the perspective of the snake like it's it's a dangerous idea to eat something sure like to once you've committed to biting it and swallowing it it's difficult to get it out right. in the middle middle of swallowing it you're kind of committed to swallowing it and there's just like the whole battle of biting it and subduing it and so, like, eating something is, like, something they have to think about a little bit because it's 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 a dangerous endeavor. Even after it's dead and inside them, it can cause them that's so either wild. incredible discomfort, long-term stress, or death. Yeah, right. that's wild. <laughs> yeah, and, they're, and, and snakes, I mean, rattlesnakes, is, um, you know, all snakes don't chew their food. And rattlesnakes are actually um, sit-and-wait predators. So they kind of just sit and wait for their prey to run by, and then they actually will strike it. And, and venomate their prey so they'll actually inject the venom into the prey and that is how they kill it it is, it, it is. and then the, the animal will run off and die and then they will actually you know everyone thinks about snakes using their tongue to smell which is basically true they do that and they can actually scent trail their own venom and so actually go out and oh. find the prey that they've killed and oh, then they'll that's consume super it. interesting yeah huh yeah. 
Yeah, there's very few. There are some that uh, in, I can't think of any other than the coral snake, maybe in North America, that yeah. venomous snakes that bite and hold their prey. I would imagine maybe a cotton mouth. For yeah, a fish. that's probably yeah. true. Cotton mouth is, yeah. a, is another one. But, okay. but, but usually they the bite. The strategy, it. because they don't constrict, they don't subdue their prey, and like the venom doesn't work immediately. It work, sure. can work very rapidly in some, sure. some rodents. But if they bite it and hang on to it, there's a risk that that prey will bite and attack them. So it's really their best decision to bite and retreat and just say like, well, I'm gonna wait for that to take effect. Yep. And that's, you know, you'll hear a lot of talk about venomous snakes in other places like Australia where they're really famous, like, oh, one drop of this will kill like a billion people or something oh, like that. Oh, yes. One of the reasons that are hypothesized for that is because the faster that prey dies, the safer the snake is. Right. So it's this race for the snake to have a venom compound that is so strong that the prey it's trying to subdue doesn't it doesn't hurt the snake. Oh, I see. It's like a defense mechanism. So they're not like chasing stuff down. Like they just there are some active and... foraging snakes, but but yeah. most venomous snakes are not. Are not. especially vipers like like what we what rattlesnakes are. These big heavy bodied snakes. They're gonna kind of scent trail to where there's a rodent trail on the ground. They can smell it and they're gonna wait there for the the prey to go running by. Um, and it's rodents aren't the only you know, prey that they're going to consume. Some some will forage on birds if they can. Uh, when they're smaller, oftentimes they'll eat insects. Um, oh. Sidewinder, which is one species we do have here in the state, they'll actually eat a lot of um, other reptiles. So Interesting. Yeah, hmm. lizards. and So it's there's a wide variety for sure. And um, and, and actually, this is this, incidentally, it's kind of a, it's, it's sort of a neat um, thing to think about, but they've done studies looking at um, venom composition. And there's a study that's recently been done in Colorado. And the same species of rattlesnake, um, the the amount of the different ratio of proteins and, and enzymes in their venom can can differ across a, a pretty small geographic region based on the type of prey that they're consuming. Oh, interesting. So it, it really makes a pretty big difference on, you know, venom composition and things like that. So mm, That is interesting. Yeah. So kind of going into that, where typically do we find rattlesnakes here in the state? Like where can somebody expect to stumble upon one while they're hiking or camping or whatever? <laughs> I would say depending on the month, I'll be bold and say this, like almost literally anywhere in Utah can okay. have rattlesnakes. So I, one of an amusing conversation I had, uh, well, it was about the start of the pandemic. I got a call from someone from the paper in Park City. So there's a bunch of people from California moving up here and they don't know how to live around wildlife. And I know they don't have rattlesnakes up here. It's like, oh, it, oh yeah, you you definitely do. Oh, <laughs> They're like, no, no, we're too high for rattlesnakes. It's like, oh no, you could find a rattlesnake at 10,000 feet in, Interesting. in Utah. That's that's totally possible. Okay. I haven't personally, but I know two other herpers who find them yeah. uh, along the Wasatch Front at like nine and 10,000 feet during the summer. So. I see. Usually I think people do associate it with like they need heat and they're just in St. George or whatever, but right. you could find them anywhere. And, and that is a hot spot for them, um, for sure. I mean, we have more species down in the southwest corner of the state than we do in any other part of the state, um, but they're they're statewide. We might have abundance-wise, the Wasatch Front still might be right. where you're most likely to see one. Just because there's more people out and about? Well, that and the... There's only one species along the Wasatch Front, and I call it the Great Basin Rattlesnake, though it's Western Rattlesnake, Great Basin Rattlesnake. It's like one of those weird species complex things, but not to backtrack to there. But it's just a very, very common snake, and a lot of its hibernacula are in the Wasatch Front. And so, yeah, there's a lot of people that see them, but it's also just really abundant. Gotcha. It's just, it's a really common snake. Interesting. I think on iNaturalist, it's like the third or fourth most common reported reptile. Yeah. That people see. Mm -hmm. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, and with that, like, what are some unique things about rattlesnakes? Like, what would, like, basically, how do you tell a rattlesnake is a rattlesnake? And then, yeah, just some other kind of unique things. That yeah. Um, I mean, the obvious thing is a rattle. And it, it, I say obvious, but it's not always so obvious. It really depends on the size of the snake. Um, and... You know, we have a couple of small species in the state. Sidewinders are not very big. Um, speckled rattlesnakes are not very big. And midget faded rattlesnakes, as the name implies, they're not very big. And so if they're small, the rattle is not super prominent. I see. Um, you hear all kinds of things out there. You hear, well, you know, if it's got a triangular head, if it does this, then it's going to be a rattlesnake. And, I mean, there is a little bit of truth to that, but there's a lot of snakes that can kind of mimic that as well. And so, um, you know, the main thing to look for is a rattle. Um, it's... 
but if you're not sure, I, this is probably a good place to kind of interject this here. If you're not sure, you should stay away from the sure. snake. Sure, sure. Um, <laughs> just you don't want to be approaching a snake that you're not familiar with. Um, sure. I think both Drew and I could probably walk up and identify a rattlesnake from Oh, quite a few. Yeah, <laughs> you just there's there Once is. You've, I mean, if you spent your time looking for them, you just get a search image. But at the same time, it becomes challenging to articulate it to someone who's it, like, "But how do you know?" Right. Sure. Yeah. Um, they're heavy. Tell it to rattlesnake because of the way that it is. Right. right. Exactly. <laughs> right. It's a hundred percent true. Yeah. Right. I mean, they're heavy-bodied snakes, and so they they have very stout, heavy-bodied, um, heavy bodies. We don't have a ton of other snakes in Utah that have as stout of a body as these ones do. I mean, you have. You know, some smaller ones like rubber boas and a few other ones that are, are pretty stout. But, um, you know, our most common snake in, in Utah is probably a gopher snake or a mm-hmm. bull snake. And, um, you know, they have a similar pattern. And so people can easily mistake them. But in terms of the, the actual diameter of the body, I mean, a rattlesnake for the length of the snake is going to be considerably more robust, assuming it's healthy and, sure. and been eating and doesn't have any other issues. Um, do they, do, speaking of the pattern, do they all have kind of that diamond pattern or no like which sp- speckled rattlesnakes might yeah. be arguably one of the most bizarrely patterned snakes in the nation yeah um, um i mean speaking in utah like having sort of blotches or diamonds that kind of go down the back is i guess kind of common across them but like midget faded rattlesnakes right. the faded was- part is because as they age they lose this patterning yep. oh interesting. and so they become they can even be quite pink in some cases hmm. um, yeah. and, and look like the Colorado Plateau where they live. But, yeah, the patterning is also, you know, it's like you look at a bull snake sometimes it's like, yeah, you're kind of trying to be a rattlesnake. Right. But, and then, but if he was trying to be a speckled rattlesnake, he's failing miserably. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I usually tell him that, too. When I see <laughs> you're him, the yeah, worst yeah, speckled you're, rattlesnake What I've a ever loser. Seen. Yeah. <laughs> so one of the other... Speaking of rattles, and we're kind of going to get into this in a little bit too, but mm. one of the things that I've heard is like baby rattlesnakes don't have rattles. Mm. Is that true or is that false? Mm. That is, <laughs> <laughs> well, we can open a whole can of baby rattlesnakes with that. <laughs> um, they, they, so a rattlesnake is born with what they call a button, basically, which is, so rattles are, are divided into segments. And every time... You hear the myth a lot that every time, or you know, a rattle, a rattlesnake will add a rattle every year, which is maybe true, but is is not. What actually, every time they shed their skin, and so snakes are going to shed their skin in, in one piece, typically if they're healthy. Every time they shed their skin, they're going to add a new segment to the to the base of the rattle, and the rattle is the same. Oh. It's keratin. It's the same thing as your hair and fingernails, and um, so a, a baby is born with one segment, and that segment is called the button, and it's. It, at that point, it can't really make any noise um, because there's nothing to there's nothing to move against. Against, yeah. So, so the things that actually make the noise is the segments rubbing against each other. It is. They're hollow. Oh. There's no. It's not like a baby rattle with a bunch of beads inside yeah. of it. It's just interlocking segments that that will click together. Side note, though, they still try. Yes, they, they do. Still, they still will go through the motion. Yeah. So they're born with that innate ability to. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Almost. It's very most snakes, especially in colubrids. Yeah rattle their tail yeah interesting and and for the audience drew was just wagging his tail oh yeah he was yeah he really was yeah (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) okay interesting yeah and and actually what drew just said um a lot of the colubrid snakes which are the more common family of snakes in the united states and they're non-venomous um they they will often mimic some some species will often mimic rattlesnakes by vibrating their tail um in leaf litter or you know vegetation or whatever to kind of make that vibration noise um, and so that's that's one of the reasons that it can be difficult to identify a rattlesnake just based solely on the presence of the rattle. And most people aren't going to get close enough to see if it's actually a rattle or not. Sure. I they always, just hear something yeah. that sounds like a rattle and they're like, okay, right. bye. And the other thing that, that a lot of non-venomous snakes will do um, is they'll, they'll flatten out their head and make it look a lot more triangular, which is something else you hear a lot with rattlesnakes. Is that, that is they have, so interesting. Yeah. Um, they like know that that's more of a threat. And so they try to pretend like they are that snake. Yeah. And that's fascinating. It's it, yeah, there's a. I mean, there's a lot of variability in how they'll, they'll mimic and things, but um, yeah, it, what I tell people a lot of times too is, or, in order to make a noise, a rattlesnake has to hold its tail basically vertical so those segments can click together and and rattle. Sure. Um, whereas a lot of the colubrid or the non venomous snakes, they have to stick their tail kind of straight out, and so that's one of the things you can sort of cue in on. But you know, you shouldn't. 
Sure. If you can't see that from a distance, you probably yeah. shouldn't get Don't get close get enough. Close to... enough. Is, the snake yeah. sh- is the tail straight up or not? Right. Yeah. <laughs> the yeah, bull snakes are famous for, for hissing and like oh, yeah. kind of going through a whole sort of performance to kind of look intimidating. I'm not from Utah. I've you know, only been here since 2018. Do you know the common name for a bull snake in Utah? A, a blow snake. A blow snake or a bloat snake, both. Yeah. I've heard, uh-huh. I didn't know this until I moved to Utah, but. That's, oh, that's yeah. what people call Yeah, them, I'd huh? heard people talk about oh, yeah. them, and I was like, what are you talking about? It drives me crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and everyone bloat, everyone bloat I work with knows this and okay. will tell me that they have seen a blow snake mm-hmm. or a bloat snake. And You're it, like, wrong name. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Come and back I, later when you get it right. <laughs> right. I know they're pushing my buttons. But I, <laughs> right, right. I, it, it works. Every time. So what are some other kind of interesting facts about rattlesnakes that people might not know? You'd mentioned that they give birth to live babies. They do, yeah. So rattlesnakes, uh, most snakes in the United States will lay eggs, but um, not all. And and rattlesnakes are, are all, all rattlesnakes that we know about give birth to live young. And uh, I did not know that until yeah. you had said that. Yeah. Yeah, That's most people don't. Um, and they typically do it in the late summer or fall too, which is sort of atypical for what we sort of associate with a lot of animals. And Yeah. Um, most it's like in the springtime in Utah. And, yeah. Yeah. And interesting. And I don't know necessarily the, the breeding timing of all the rattlesnake species we have here, but um, the species I did my graduate work on, timber rattlesnakes back in the, the Midwest, um, they would actually mate in the fall as well and then kind of overwinter um, and then impregnate in the spring. Um, so oh, they would wow. actually, yeah, it, it was delayed fertilization basically. Huh. Um, and and so there's a lot of pretty cool things with that. There's also some, I mean, there's some upsides to doing that. I mean, they can pick where they're going to gestate their, their babies in the proper temperature because we all know snakes are cold blooded. So they can't, they can't warm that, you know, the embryos themselves or the eggs, if it's a, an egg laying snake. Um, so they can pick those areas to, to gestate their young, but that also means that they're, you know, they have to find those areas that's going to be harder for them to move. Most of the time we, we, the term for a pregnant snake is gravid. And so gravid, Rattlesnakes oftentimes will not eat during that time as well when they're gestating their young, and so there's there's some downsides to doing that. But um, yeah, it's a it's a pretty interesting strategy. And I'm, it, I'm gonna lay some ecological speculation on you. So I, do there, it. There's seasonality to Drew's, breeding. Drew's getting deep on us. Oh, timber no. rattlesnakes in the east because you have very regular and dependable seasons. Right. In the west, in the arid environments, the only real dependable season we have here is cold and hot. Right. And I would bet you that rattlesnakes are far more flexible. Yeah. Plastic would be the fancy word, <laughs> but flexible in like when and where they breed. Yeah. I add, I have a photograph somewhere of some sidewinders breeding in Washington County that I took in May of last year. Yeah. Um, and it was it was a bit weird to find them because it, it was a drought and it was in a Burns car. And I think it was just opportunity yeah. knock. They happened to find each other and it was mm. like, warm enough. Like, okay, let's, let's get this done. Um, but I would bet a lot of it has to do with the monsoon. And no, I bet it does as well. And in Southern California, um, where I, I lived and worked for a long time, uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnakes were very dual kind of phasic in terms of their, their breeding. So you had a spring and a fall kind of breeding season. Because so. the, the only other, well, that's, um, no, this is more of those biology things you can't like expand too much, say the only, but the other venomous, rep, the other famous venomous reptile in Utah does have a seasonality pattern, but it's trying to time it for foraging for nesting birds and yep. rabbits merging. That's the Gila monster. The Gila monster, monster yes. So. Oh, that's cool. So with kind of one of the other interesting facts, or maybe I just think it's interesting, um, with them being cold-blooded, kind of talk about what that means. Like, do rattlesnakes hiber- quote-unquote hibernate? Or, like, how does that work when it's all cold and snowy <laughs> in Utah? They just laugh at my question. No, no. It's <laughs> they're good questions. They're very good questions. Because he, I know why he's laughing. Well, I'll let him correct me if I'm wrong. But No, go he's, ahead. He, they're good questions because they're not wrong and they're not right. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. There's, there's no one true answer, I see. So, I mean, being, being cold-blooded um, basically just means that you don't generate body heat through metabolic processes at least enough to kind of regulate most of the bodily functions and things and so snakes typically need to to bask in the sun to warm up in order to do things and they have a kind of a preferred thermal preference you know they're not going to just allow their body to 
fluctuate all over the, the body temperature to fluctuate all over the place based on the temperature. So they're going to, you know, pick shaded spots if they need to cool down and they're going to bask out in the sun. And um, this actually leads to a lot of the rattlesnakes in, in a lot of the warmer desert climates are what we sort of call facultatively diurnal or nocturnal. And that basically that just means that they sort of shift their activity patterns when it warms up to more nocturnal nighttime behavior than oh. um, than when it's cooler. If it gets too hot, they don't like that mm-hmm. either, basically. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Um, as far as hibernation or brumation or however you want to, or torp, I mean, there's all, there's all lots of different terms for this. Um, I can see Drew's eyes lighting up, so maybe he wants to talk about oh, it a no. bit more. Oh, yeah, no. This is, I, you, yeah. you uh, I have no life ring for you. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> this they, is the weakest part of my training. They, <laughs> they do, they do, I'll just stick with hibernation. They do, in effect, hibernate. Um, and they, Oftentimes with rattlesnakes, they will, when it gets cold, and again, it depends on where you are geographically, it depends on where you are elevationally, um, there's not always a hard cutoff for this. Um, they, they do tend to, I think Drew referred to it earlier as, as hibernacula, uh, which is plural for hibernaculum, which is basically a densite. And so a densite oh. is oftentimes where these it's snakes like will come. It's like a snake doggy pile. Like. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah. yeah. And not all species do that either. Okay. I mean, it's communal denning is known in, in a lot of rattlesnake species, and there are quite a few. Especially the massasaugas you mentioned, they don't do it. They will go down in a crayfish burrow and. They're loners. Yep. They sleep hmm. alone. Yep. Hmm. And there's, you know, a lot of the ones probably in, in Southern California. I used to see, I used to see speckled rattlesnakes in the, the winter a lot of times just in a rock crevice by themselves. And Interesting. so it's going to depend on, on how. But some rattlesnakes in Utah do kind of the group yes. hibernating thing. Absolutely, okay. yeah. Um, yeah, the, the the one that's most common, on the, the only one on the Wasatch Front, has can have quite huge hibernation. I mean, you have hundreds. Oh, even, wow. I would venture to say in some cases thousands of snakes in the same hibernation, depending would, on yeah. how. It's like Indiana Jones, like uh-huh. his nightmare. People, there's there are herpers in Utah that know where they are, and they they. They, they start getting ready, at, say, in April or late March, and they start staking them out to watch them come yeah. out, which is... Interesting. Egress. Yes. Egress and ingress is in the fall when they go back in. Hmm. Egress is I, when they come out. I take umbrage to the term nightmare, by the way. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it's more like a good, a great I, dream. I mean, this is like a good topic. Though. Like, I, was, like, I have, in my history, like had my blood boil or my hackles raised when people like say negative things about snakes. Sure. Uh, over time, I've come to realize that I'm the unusual one. Sure. Like I, I just like these things, and I'm and I'm weird. Like the term is right, Drew. <laughs> <laughs> you guys and your but it's your like it, to to respect and and Absolutely. not feel comfortable around a snake is actually kind of a good feeling. Like I don't want to make anyone feel bad for not liking snakes sure. or being uncomfortable around sure. them. Sure. Because getting bit by a rattlesnake is a serious thing. Sure. And and like. Seeing a snake and not knowing what it is and having a reaction of like I don't want to mess with that. That's a safety. Sure. That's a safe response. Like um, I, I want to encourage mechanism. that. Yeah. What I don't want to encourage is like, you know, radical violence towards a snake or like sure. hatred. Like, that's the also like, that's also, that is wrong. Sure. But, uh, but but yeah, like <laughs> I, I I lean more towards Scott. Like when people say these negative things about snakes, it's like, <laughs> I mean, they're so cool. Right. <laughs> but, right. So with that, kind of Mm -hmm. what are some of the common misconceptions that you guys hear about rattlesnakes, whether it's, you know, yeah, kind of things that maybe are incorrect that feeds into this fear or stereotypes that we see of rattlesnakes? Sure. Um, Well, I mean, as as we just pointed out, you know, they're they're amazing. So anything (laughs) negative is going to be a misconception. No, they... Um, there's a lot. And with rattlesnakes, I already mentioned the, you know, they add a rattle segment every time they shed, which is a myth. Um, I think one of the, the ones. No, that, no, you said it right. It's not, they don't get a, bu- they don't see? get a, they don't get a button every, for every Man, year I'm of losing age. nerd points. Every time they, sh- every time they shed, they yeah, get a new do. button. It's every time they shed is not a myth. Every time it's. It's not, it doesn't indicate their age. It does not indicate their age. Thank right. you, Drew. It's a, it's a relative measure of their age. It is. It is. If you know the shedding rate. Mm-hmm. Um, which is going to be variable across their life. Um, I saved you. You did. <laughs> you can tell you, you can have my nerd point on that one. <laughs> um, I, I think one of the things I hear I, quite a bit, um, and this is another one of the people who know me well, this is another button push. Um, there's actually, there's two. One is that rattlesnakes are poisonous. Um, they're venomous. And they're, oh, there sure. is a difference. Um, you know, poison is something you have to consume and eat to get sick from, and venom is injected. 
um, and and all rattlesnakes are. There, there is a poisonous snake, though. There, yeah, I know, I, th- <laughs> there is, but he always not, has to like. Not <laughs> actually. Yeah, not in, not in Utah. States, yeah. No, there 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 are Which, in the Pacific Northwest the ones that eat the newts. Oh yeah, yeah, you're right. That eat okay, the, the Pacific newts and they mm-hmm. yeah they do. But they. But in Utah. In, in Utah, Utah, as far as I know, there are no poisonous can, snakes. They're just venomous. Okay. I don't encourage you to eat our snakes, however. Yeah. D- just in general, don't eat a garter snake. Not that I'm predicting that that's going to be a trending thing, but you never know these yeah, days. You know. Hmm. But, um, but the other the other common myth that you hear a lot is that the the baby rattlesnakes are more dangerous than the adults. Um, and oh, you, like that they're more venomous or something. Yeah. Um, and you hear this. I do hear that. I, I he- have heard that. I hear it all the time. Um, and it's that is. That is a myth, and it's been debunked numerous times in, in various types of research. Um, and the the rationale I hear most often is that, so rattlesnakes actually can, when they bite, they can meter their venom. And what I mean by that is they don't, they can, can they whether it's a conscious thing. Yeah, how much it, they release, It basically. may be conscious. There's, there's, that's the debate. And some people say it's based on how hard they strike, and some people say it's a conscious thing. Regardless mm-hmm. of what it is, they, the amount of venom they put out is not, uh, it's not the same every time they bite. And they can dry bite, too. Um, in fact, 30 to 40% of bites are estimated to be dry bites. Um, oh, interesting. And so um, the the thought is with baby rattlesnakes, they don't have the ability to meter their venom. And so when they bite, they will pump out all their venom. And as a result of that, they can be more dangerous. Um, but they've done a lot of, uh, I shouldn't say a lot, but there have definitely been studies that have looked at this where they've determined that, that young juvenile baby rattlesnakes can, in fact, control how much venom they put out whether it's either through that uh, you know striking at a different strength or if it's conscious in in terms of doing that but they can and not only that even if they did pump out all the venom you're talking about a venom yield that is so much smaller than these big you know heavy-bodied adults because rattlesnakes can live a long time um some of our rattlesnakes can live 20 30 years oh wow and you know snakes have relatively have indeterminate growth which means they're going to grow their entire lives so they're they're, they can get pretty big and so not all species but some species can and so let's let's just talk about a mojave rattlesnake for example it's mm. considered to be one of the more dangerous quote-unquote snakes in in utah in terms of its venom um and they you know a big mojave rattlesnake could be four or five feet in length and their venom glands are going to be considerably larger than a baby and mm. so even if they did pump out all their venom as a baby which they don't um then it would be the yield would be considerably less and so that makes most sense. bites that are you know, are more dangerous come from larger rattlesnakes. There is probably truth the venom composition does tend to change as they get older. Um, and it may be drop for drop. Some baby rattlesnakes might have slightly more potent venom, um, but it's, they're certainly not more dangerous. Hmm. So that's a, that's a myth that I hear is, a lot. That is a good debunked. Cause I have also heard that a lot. Yeah. yeah. They're still dangerous. I mean, sure. you, you, you don't want to get bit by a baby rattlesnake, sure. but um, it's not necessarily any, more any dangerous. Rattles. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> just don't don't sure. get bit. By <laughs> sure. So. so, kind of jumping off of that, like, what are some kind of good safety tips? Some kind of basic guidelines for what to do if you do encounter a rattlesnake, or if you're with your pet and encounter a rattlesnake, because that's kind of a common one that comes up is people hiking with their dogs, and you know. So, yeah, what are some kind of general guidelines that we offer for people um i mean the the first thing you mentioned pets and i think that's a good one if you're going to be hiking in rattlesnake country and as drew mentioned most of utah is rattlesnake country um it's it's good to keep your pets leashed um they dogs are relatively tolerant to rattlesnake venom but you got to think when a dog is going to get bit it's going to be in the face yeah, oh, and sure. you and you don't you don't want that vet bill. No, <laughs> even like assuming your dogs are going to survive, you just sure. you want to avoid right. that. I would I would follow up. So we're the Division of Wildlife Resources, and we sell hunting and fishing permits and encourage people to go upland hunting with dogs. It's a popular activity in Utah, and this is not just for people with hunting dogs. Though bird dogs encounter rattlesnakes at a very high frequency. Oh, I mean, we have yeah. some bird seasons that open relatively early in Utah, yeah. and like. A lot of chucker habitat is also rattlesnake habitat. Absolutely. The quail habitat in southwest Utah is also rattlesnake habitat. And, like, in the west in particular, rattlesnake bites and bird dogs are pretty common. Yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we have a list uh, that we'll put up later, I guess, of, of contacts for, for um, dog trainers that do snake aversion training, which is a thing. 
I recommend everyone do it that has a dog that wants to do outdoor dog stuff in Utah. Sure. I think I think it should just be standard. <laughs> if if I could wave my hand and just magically pay for everybody to have it done, I would because sure. it's the safest thing for your dog. Like if you can't do it, definitely do a leash. Most people are going to do a leash. That definitely is a very effective way to do it. <laughs> I'm not discrediting leashes at all, but rattlesnake aversion training is very effective. It does work, and it's just a really easy investment in your and your dog safety. Um, kind of training the dog what to do. Training the dog what to do. Because the dog will probably be aware that the snake is present before you are Sure. in a lot of cases. And so the dog can, I don't want to go do this. And I I, I don't want to speak for these trainers, but I think a lot of what they do is also training you to recognize the behaviors in the dog when the dog's starting to act, for lack of a better word, snaky. Oh, I see. So that you're, you're also kind of like, communicating with your dog like oh he's acting a little snaky let's go somewhere else gotcha because you could get confused on a bird hunt you could say that dog is acting birdie (laughs) like when there's a snake present so there's some nuance to it but everyone i know that's done it has celebrated it and it says like it's either really minimized or completely reduced interactions with rattlesnakes for the for the upland hunters that i know that have done it that's cool and i've never heard anybody who has gone through it say that it wasn't worth it sure to do so I, i highly recommend Everyone that wants to hike with their dogs seek, seek that kind of training. Cool. Right? Yeah, I agree. Um, and then, of course, the, there's there's human safety, which is, um, you know, equally or more important, depending on your perspective of humans and dogs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's, you know, the main thing is if you recognize that there is a rattlesnake present is to keep a distance, a safe distance. And in, in most of the snakes that we have here, rattlesnakes, I, a safe distance would probably be six feet or more. Um, there's all kinds of ideas that these snakes can can launch and jump and can strike, you know, three times their body length. And there's not a hard cutoff for what they can and can't do. But um, keeping a good adequate distance is, is really important. Um, you know, if you if you need to continue down the path that you're on and there's a snake on the side of the trail, you want to try and keep that distance as you move past the snake. Just go off trail, kind of give them a wide circle type of thing. If you can, make sure that if make sure there's not another rattlesnake around. Um, sometimes if it's mating season, you can there can be like multiple. Those dens I talked about. Yeah. Like it's, as we enter spring and you're going to hike some trails in the Wasatch Front, if you see a rattlesnake on some of these Wasatch Front trails, I would be wary that there's probably another one close by because oh, yeah. you're you're seeing you found one near where he came out. Right. Um, in general. Yeah. You know, it's best to just assume walking wide around the snake is going to be effective. Right. But in, in the spring around here, I would say it's worth noting that <laughs> you might be in a little bit of a hot spot. Right? Sure. And, and post, kind of post uh, egress and mm-hmm. post mating, they, they typically are solitary. So I, we get people asking all the time, like, well, I have one rattlesnake. Does that mean I have a den and it's the middle of July? And it's no. like, no. Um, but that is something to, you know, to, to, if you're going to go off trail to move around a snake, be conscious of that. Um you know, the the best thing to do is, if you can, is to back up, give them space, and oftentimes they'll move off on their own. Um, you don't want to throw anything at them. You don't want to try and poke them with a stick. Uh, that's a really good way to agitate the snake. Oftentimes, too, I've seen when people have tried to do stuff like that, oftentimes the snake will just coil up even more and hmm. sit tight. Um, they won't, like, come at you typically, though, do they? They'll just usually coil up? Very, it's it's unusual, but it, it happens. And I mean, okay. I know. I'll let Scott go on. No, you're... Uh, that's, like, I mean, the, I, the sna- I'll, I'll, never mind. I'll take it back. <laughs> <laughs> he, like, he's, he is holding on to that talking stick I, I now. Like, uh, I, I have the stick. <laughs> uh, you can, if you would choose to try to harass the snake to get it to move on, the snake will choose a direction that and commit to it. And that direction could be the same direction as you. Hmm. That doesn't mean the snake mm-hmm. is chasing you or trying to aggress or return some sort of aggression. That's just the direction it chose. And that snake very well, that you may be in the snake's home. He may very well know that you are between him and where he wants to be. That's not, it, it's, a, it's a big leap to say like he's being aggressive. Right. Um, and which is all the more reason to not throw or poke a stick at the snake. If the snake is still and you can see it, you're about... You're only maybe one degree less maximum safety than you could be if there was no snake there at all. Um, but if you can see the snake and the snake's not moving and you're at a safe distance, you're you're pr- you're pretty good shape. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that, and I I probably have several thousand rattlesnake encounters through you know tracking with radio telemetry and and whatnot. But I there's been one snake, one rattlesnake, and it was a speckled rattlesnake in Southern California that turned and came at me in a way that I would. 
I felt a little threatened at the time. And and then it finally backed up, and it would kind of move up the hillside, and every three feet it would turn around and strike back at me and keep going. And then I went up the trail that I was on, and there was a, a barn owl that was on the ground. So I'm guessing there was some kind of negative encounter before I got there between the barn owl and the rattlesnake that <laughs> oh. agitated it before I got there. It was there. already just yeah. ready to go. Um, yeah. And so, I mean, most of the time, their main defense is camouflage. And so, they, S- Side note, how many snakes did you ever track that had talon scars on them? Oh, gosh. I don't know. It's a good question. I'd have to think about it. It's pretty common. I it, mean, like bull snakes in Utah, you yeah. see them a lot with like That's talon scars. They escape. They yeah. escape the encounter with a bird of prey, which mm-hmm. is amazing in and of it itself. It is. Yeah. But. No, I, quite a few. Yeah. Interesting. Um, so, and, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say. So I didn't realize this until I learned here, which shows my ignorance too. But um, I I wanted to plug too that it is illegal actually to kill rattlesnakes in the state of Utah unless you're like acting in self-defense which me and drew have kind of talked and a lot of that's that, a fuzzy space yeah a lot of that quote-unquote self-defense is because the person was like harassing the snake and so it coiled up or you know whatever but yeah no it is it can be like a class b misdemeanor i've talked to our law enforcement about it and a lot of people don't realize that because that's kind of the natural like instinct right or that you know there's conception you know the the what that's what you do you know as you see a snake and you kill it and so Anyway, I just wanted to plug that as well because that was something that was new to me that I didn't realize. I'm not going to say that this was the guidance for for writing that particular regulation, but I will say that choosing to interact with a snake is the best way to get bit by one. Sure. <laughs> and like, so if you are if you think going and killing it with a shovel or a hoe or something is like some sort of service you're doing or you're protecting your own safety, you're putting yourself at risk by doing that. Most snake bite victims. We're interacting with the snake, and, and of that most, most are trying to kill it. Oh, yeah. Um, you'll see people on TV, and I'm not going to mention any names, like picking snakes up with their bare hands, some three-finger hold behind the head. At least amongst the professional herpetologists that I know that study snakes and have made a life study, none of them touch snakes with their bare hands anymore, unless they're in a tube, which is a, it's a clear plastic tube that the snake goes in with tools and they grip the snake way down on the body and its head is feet away from yeah, their hands. Sure. So that's the only way I've ever seen any herpetology, herpetologist that I have respect for be willing to put their bare hands on a snake and like most of their hand is on the tube and the snake. Sure. But anyway, it, most professional herpetologists use tongs and hooks and bags and other tools and don't touch snakes directly with their hands. Yeah. That makes because, a lot of sense to and, me. And these are, right? <laughs> I mean, and these are people that love these animals and they're really fascinated by them. They want to study them and they don't want to, they're not, they're like, no, they're dangerous. I don't, I don't want to touch them. Yeah. So. And, and I, I don't think people realize either just how strong rattlesnakes are. I mean, they're tubes of muscle mm-hmm. and it's, it's a lot of, I mean, it, it's a lot of muscle in there and you're trying to hold that snake behind the head. It's not that it's not that difficult for that snake to kind of turn a little not bit. Not to mention the the fangs are independently right. mobile. Yes. So oh, rattlesnakes have their fangs are, <clears throat> you know, essentially on hinges and they can swing out and they're independently mobile, like Drew said. And so they oftentimes can get one out. And I, I know at least a couple of people who have attempted to do that and gotten a fang oh, geez. in the finger. Mm-hmm. And so it's, yeah, they're, they're strong and wow. it's not hard for them to. to I know three people that have been bitten. By venomous snakes, and they were all Me- holding them, messing with the snake, yeah, <laughs> sure. as they saw on TV. Sure. Um, so, kind of segueing into this, so what should somebody do if they are bitten by a rattlesnake? And this is a great question. Um, it's very unlikely that this will happen, but um, if it does, there's a lot of misinformation out there. So, it's I think it's good to address it. Um, the the number one thing that you you want to do is you want to seek medical attention sure Um, you know there's we'll talk about some of the other things that you should or shouldn't do but i mean that's really that for venomous snake bites in the united states um and again we're talking about rattlesnakes which is our only dangerously venomous group of snakes in utah um you need to seek medical attention and uh you will typically receive if it's not a dry bite you will typically receive anti-venom which there is a lot of myth. It's just like a shot. It's it's sh- shots, plural, typically. Mm. Oh, <laughs> depending fun. depending on the species you're bitten by, it could be a lot. Fun, a lot. But fun. And okay. there's there's two there's two main kinds of uh, there's two companies that make anti venom, and the the amount of anti venom is slightly different with each. I won't go into it, but um, in effect, you're that is really the best way to to treat a snake bite. And uh, there's 
the reason I bring this up so early kind of in this conversation about what to do in a snake bite is there's, there's a myth out there that oftentimes the treatment is worth, worse than the bite. Um, and I think a lot of that stems from sort of the very early days of rattlesnake treatment or, or venomous snake treatment where antivenoms were not necessarily um, as, as good as they are now. Um, a lot of people concern, are concerned about things like anaphylaxis and other things that can happen with a, a, you know, a snake uh, or snake, venomous snake bite treatment. Um, hospitals can treat that without a problem. That's easy to do. Gotcha. Um, so there's really not a concern there. And I, 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 it's almost unheard of nowadays to have, you know, really, really, really adverse reactions um, from antivenom that, that are seriously uh, endanger health. And so um, getting medical attention is really important. Um, remaining calm is, I know that's going to be difficult if somebody mm-hmm. is bitten by a rattlesnake, um, is super important. Uh, you want to, you know, minimize the, the blood flow as sure. much as you can. And um, another thing that you want to try to do, because rattlesnake bites are, their, their venom is typically hemotoxic and what they say call cytotoxic. So those are, are venom compositions that are going to cause lots of swelling and tissue damage. And so one of the things you want to do if you can is remove constricting jewelry, constricting clothing, oh, things yeah. like that that would maybe create complications later on because of the swelling. And so that's- Cut off your circulation or yep, something. Exactly. And, and that's one of the biggest risks from a rattlesnake bite does come from that tissue damage and that massive amount of swelling that's probably going to take place. And so that's, that's a really important, remaining calm, uh, removing constricting jewelry and clothing. Um, is it usually just centralized to where you got bitten? Like if I get bit in the hand, is it mostly my hands just going to swell or like my whole up my arm kind of situation too? So- this kind of gets into that area of there is no normal hmm. um, and there's there's no there's no hard and fast rule if you're bitten here this is what's going to happen sure. it's, it's incredibly variable it depends on so many factors if you have existing health conditions where you were bitten did multiple fangs penetrate the skin how much venom was injected there's there's so much variability in there typically you're gonna the swelling will take place around the bite site but it's not unheard of to have you know if you're if you're bitten on the finger to have swelling progress up the arm and things mm. like that. Um, you're typically not going to have it, you know, swelling in the foot if you're if you're bitten in the hand. Sure. Uh, the tissue damage is going to be fairly localized to, to the limb that you're bitten on. Um, not like becoming the Michelin man, like you, instantly, yeah. <laughs> like just suddenly you're Probably just, not, but again, I mean, that yeah, variation. Again, I it's know. probably <laughs> happened. I, I did hear, so I, I attended a Venom conference and they, they told a story of two guys who picked up a timber rattlesnake which is actually one of the more venomous species they're pretty mild and and placid in terms of handling them but uh, they decided to play catch with the snake oh gosh and they were passing it back and forth there's always that guy Uh you know (laughs) and and one guy one guy caught it and it bit him in the face oh my gosh and then in retaliation he punched the snake (gasps) and it bit him in the hand oh my gosh And then he grabbed it with the other hand, and it bit him in the other hand. Oh so he gosh. received three bites oh in a span gosh. of like 30 seconds. Who's, who's that old action hero oh movie guy man. from the 80s? Because there's that gif of him punching Oh, yeah, snake. yeah. When, right. when, no, oh, one Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris wouldn't do something so no, dumb. Of course I can't not. remember his name. Oh, uh, that's terrible. So uh, he may have swelled up like the Michelin Man. Oh, man. Um, but typically from, a, I mean, one bite, that's not going to happen. <laughs> sure. Um, that's, oh, my gosh. But, but that's really, I mean, getting that medical attention is, is critical and it's really important. And then the kind of, the dovetail into that, there's a lot of things you shouldn't do, which are sort of those myths. And sort of the old one you should probably start off with is the, you know, the cut and suction method. And you hear that a lot. Like, mm-hmm. should I take a razor blade or a knife and cut it and try and suck out the venom? No. No. <laughs> don't. Don't do that. Yeah, that is that is not a good not a good thing. And there's there's lots of different reasons for that. I mean, one, you're in a heightened state and you probably don't want to be wielding a knife on your own skin. I yeah. mean, that can cause all kinds of damage. Uh, you're not going to suck out enough venom to make any difference at all. Mm. Um, there's there's no reason to do that. Uh, also, you're putting the venom into your mouth. Right. Oh yeah. Which yeah. if you have sores or any kind of ulcer or anything in there, oh, you gosh. can you're going to ingest it even faster. And then. There's oftentimes you hear about extractor kits, and that's something that's pretty common. In fact, I even know people you who can still buy them. I oh think. yeah, yeah, I yeah. know people who carry them in their packs. Yeah, like a venom extractor. Yep, they have been sold as a treatment for stings. Yeah. I will not say whether or not I know if that's a decent thing to do because hmm. I don't. But that's I think their original intent was to pull out 
like wasp or bee sting mm-hmm. stuff. Whether or not that works, I also don't know. Yeah, I know that it is a bad idea for snakes. It mm-hmm. is, um, and those those kits often comes come with a razor where you're supposed to kind of shave the the hair off there so you can form a suction, and then it goes over there and it's a negative suction device where you press down a button and it puts negative pressure on the bite site and it's supposed to withdraw venom. The problem with that is, and they've done studies looking at, at pig tissue and you know even effects of humans using it as well. You're putting negative pressure on that. You're you're going to cause all kinds of pooling of the venom in that spot. You're probably not going to extract enough to make a difference. Um, oh, and then it's just more concentrated you're, on that. You're, you're, tissue. You can cause all kinds of tissue damage there. Oh. Um, it's it's been debunked numerous times, but it's still really prevalent out there. Interesting. Uh, I think you ought to mention the other one, tourniquets. Yep, absolutely. You do not want to do that with any of our rattlesnake bites. Applying any kind of pressure band or a tourniquet, anything that's going to restrict the blood flow is not good. As we mentioned, because it's hematoxic and cytotoxic, you're going to get this massive amount of swelling. Oh. Um, and Likely you can, w- worst case scenario, you die. Right. Close after that is you're going to lose limb or tissue or limb function. Like, mm. you know, you could lose a whole arm, yes. a finger. Mm. Uh, well, uh, Henry Fitch, I think he didn't oh, have oh. a couple fingers. But, Fitch did not, yeah. Uh, he was missing some fingers for sure. Um, Bill Host, he was a famous venom guy from <laughs> from Florida. If you can find uh-huh. videos of Bill Host, I think he's got three fingers on two hands. So, yeah. Oh, my uh, gosh. Um, yeah, but tourniquets or anything that constricts the blood flow okay. is not is not good and there are places in the world for different types of snakes which are not in the same group as rattlesnakes where a pressure bandage may be the way to go in utah that is not the case not the case um and so you don't want to do that and similarly you don't want to apply ice that can also cause some tissue damage as well yeah i've heard that too um sometimes you hear benadryl or antihistamine that probably isn't going to have a negative effect but it's not going to I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you a story I'll be as brief as I possibly can of one of the bites I've seen happen in the field so I was in New Mexico and I saw a field technician we pulled up and they were there were three technicians walking around a truck and one of them had their arm in a sling and a tourniquet on it mm-hmm. and I was like what's going on here and they're like oh I got bit by a rattlesnake I'm trying to find the snake and they're like, why aren't you driving oh, no. to get medical attention? They're like, well, the truck won't start. I'm like, well, let's try to solve that problem first. Oh, no. I was like, also, take the tourniquet off and take the sling off, and you need to sit down. Like, please sit down yeah. and calm down. The reason the truck couldn't start, I don't really know what happened before I was there, but it was in drive. Mm. Like, I think they jumped out and tried to catch the snake, right. is, my, is my guess. Oh. And then somebody got bit. Somebody's like, oh, I'm going to start the truck so we can get out of here. They were not calm. They didn't realize the truck was in drive. Sure. And so, you know, I don't know what cars today will do, but most won't start if they're in drive. They'll no. have to be in park. And so they, they weren't calming down and thinking clearly about, like, okay, snake bite. What should sure. we do first? Sure. Put a tourniquet on, put a sling on, and look for the snake. I mean, they made the three worst choices <laughs> right off the top of the bat because the first choice they made was, like, let's, like, take a breather. Sure. You Assess the let's situation. Let's just say, Scott. You are getting bit yes, out in the field, which you will never do. I would never. I know you very well. Uh, if it was to happen, it's uh, because it was the most unfortunate of circumstances. Thank you. What are you going to do first? I would probably try and identify the snake quickly. But let's I'm, assume you don't. Let's I assume say, you're not Scott. Okay. Per- yeah. Pretend you don't know. I'm going to. I'm going to. I'm going to sit down for a minute. I'm going to calm down. Mm-hmm. I'm going to take a few deep breaths. I'm going to sort of assess my fastest way out. And then if I have a cell phone and I have cell service, the first thing I want to do is make a phone call. And I, I have great confidence in saying this. Like in Utah, if you're a bit by a snake, you have enough time to take a breather. So you step do. one, try to calm yourself, which is like a hard thing to do. I definitely understand like sure. the anxiety and the worry. Like I got bit by a snake. Sure. Step one, calm down. Yep, absolutely. And that, I mean, that really is. And you have to take, step one, take a moment. You have a moment. Yep. You're you okay. Do. For so many reasons. I mean, it's medically as well as just not making that mistake, like you just said, with the field technician, and you jump in and you try and start your car, and it's because it's in drive and not in park. And then it's just a cascade of bad decisions after that. It so. really is. Um, and this is actually a good place to, to mention, too, that identifying the snake is not imperative. If you have a phone with you that takes a picture and the snake's right there, you may want to snap a really quick picture of it and get out of there as quickly as you can after right. you and then move away to a safe spot and then calm down. Uh, and the reason I say that is the antivenoms that are used to treat snake bites are what they call polyvalent antivenoms, which are 
in the United States anyway. These are made from a concoction of different rattlesnake venoms and, and even copperhead venom as well. And so these, are, these, ven- these antivenoms are going to treat all rattlesnake bites that we have in the United States. And so you don't necessarily need to know. It may help a medical professional if you say that you were bitten by uh, a Mojave rattlesnake, which typically has some neurotoxin in their venom and it might act a little bit quicker or act in a slightly different way. It may help them in treatment a little bit, but it's, it's not imperative. If it's not a rattlesnake, like there's no venom, mm-hmm. will they be able to tell that, I guess, when you go to the hospital before they give you the antivenom or should you just, well, they'll probably monitor you just forge you ahead? For your condition. So they're, they're probably not going to like rush in and start giving you injections sure. just because you said you're a bit. They're probably going to monitor you for like, oh, See you have the symptoms of a bite. Sure. Right? And so we'll start applying the treatment because your symptoms are consistent with the kind of reactions we see from bites. Sure. Right. They're not going to start pumping that stuff into you until they're sure, sure. Uh, yeah. um, that that's happening. But let's roll back to step one, which okay. is calm. Yep. I'm going to then push you back to where you were going right after calm, which was the contact. Yep. Now there's like, uh, there can be barriers to getting contact. Absolutely. But you go from there. No, I was just, if you can, at that point, you want to dial 911 and you want to let them know what happened. And hopefully if you're in a place where you have cell service and a place where you can easily get to a place where you can receive medical attention, whether it's via helicopter flight or whether it's through an ambulance, um, you want to try to receive that medical attention as, as promptly as possible. Um, in the event that you don't have service, uh, you want to try to get yourself as calmly and as quickly as you can to a place where you can receive service. So if that means you have to get in your car and drive, you should do that, and then you should be periodically stopping and checking to see if you have that cell service so you can immediately call for medical attention. Sure. Um, if you're, like, hiking, don't have service, Start hiking back down to where you do have service and then stop hiking once you have service and call I would say unless you know that you can go so far as to, like, get to where it's easy for somebody to take care of you. So, you know, you can get to some points where you might have service, but if you still are comfortable enough and you feel okay enough to walk to the parking lot or whatever where, like, it's easy for them to just load you up great sure um you know they'll i don't really know i've never seen or heard of a life flight in utah i assume if they actually can pinpoint your location maybe they'll opt for that but i don't really know the real point is like the moment you can get in contact and communicate to someone that you are dealing with a snake bite scenario that's step one at that point, the, I would hope that the 911 person will probably advise you That's on like, I, whether or not they want you to stay put or whether sure. they not they, they want to identify the closest location that you can get to. Sure. And even in the scenario like Scott's saying, like there's places in Utah where you can still be in your car and not have a cell phone service. The moment that you have that service and you're talking to someone and you can pull over, you wait there. Sure. Because for their direction. Well, and it's for your own safety because you're now a compromised driver. With with a medical condition, right? You could you can now just you're not going to die of snake bite. You might die of car wreck. Sure. So, yep. And and that's actually a, a really good point too. Is that um, you know snake bite, rattlesnake bite is not a good thing. I mean, there's no you, there's no two ways about it. It's not. But uh, almost all venomous snake bites in the United States, where people receive treatment, um, they will survive. Sure. Um, and, but it's imperative that you do that as promptly as you can. Um, and, and so I think that it's, even if you have to, even if you are backpacking and you are out of cell service, um, you know, and you think you're hours away from being able to get that, it's still really important to be able to get yourself to a place where you can get that cell service. Right. Um, this is not, it's not like, you know, like you hear about it, like you mentioned Australian snakes, a drop of venom is going to get yeah, you yeah, to fall. Yeah. It's not, it's not the case with this. Um, you, you may be hurting and you may have some symptoms that are not pleasant, but, um, it's imperative to get that medical yeah. attention. Yeah, that's good. And yeah, you know, so I kind of distill it down maybe to like three steps. Get calm, get in contact, wait for help. Yep. Right. If you're really lucky enough that there's someone to drive you, that you have competence, that they're calm, they can drive you. One, get advice from that person you're in contact with, that medical professional, that 911 person saying like, I have someone willing to drive me to wherever you want. That's fine if they approve that because they're going to, they're probably going to try to coordinate with the ambulance along the way they sure. might pass you off right. so that can be okay but i still distill it down to the three calm contact wait sure yep no that makes a lot of sense and and just to double down on it there really is no infield first aid it's yeah. just really not an option all this being said because getting a rattlesnake bite is a significant issue like you, your life is compromised or potentially compromised if you've been bit 
it's incredibly unlikely it's going to happen. Sure. <laughs> like, sure. It just is not very sure. common at all. If right? you're being smart and yeah, being yeah. safe. I mean, it just I mean, just consider for one like how many rattlesnakes Scott has seen on a landscape and how many I've told you exist on the Wasatch Front, which is the most populated place in Utah. How many times have you heard about it? Sure. Like, I mean, they're incredibly abundant. People are incredibly abundant in the same places that rattlesnakes are, and it doesn't happen very often. Right? Sure, yeah. I mean, like we're talking single digits. Each most year. years, it doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's and, and in the in the United States, the snake bite is much more prevalent in the southeastern United States. Um, and in total, in the United States, there's probably three to five thousand venomous snake bites where people receive treatment. Uh, a vast majority of those are from the southeastern United States. And each year, each year, okay. and and death from that is you know usually less than than four people sure. a year. Sure, and, um, it's it's a significant medical issue, but it's not. Last count, there's like 29 million back. people in Texas. This is one of the most rattlesnake dense states you have, right. and it hardly ever happens. Sure, yeah. yeah, no, that's good. Yeah, I mean that's it, good context. Th- three to three to five thousand sounds like a lot until you consider the population of the United States and how yeah, many people. Yeah, there's three are, orders of magnitude more people where those right. bites happen. Right. right. So if somebody sees one in their yard, um, haven't been bit obviously, but just sees one in their yard, what's kind of our recommendation for what they should do? I'll let Drew take that one. <laughs> <laughs> the first option, I just, I, 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 I get calls about this. Sometimes. Sure, sure. And I just check with some people, like, are you okay with it? I, I think it's a perfectly valid question. Like, if, if it's your yard and you're comfortable with that rattlesnake being there, you can let it be there. It's fine. There are valid reasons to be uncomfortable with it. If you have children, especially yeah. small children Little that just kids. don't understand the risk, right. um, you know, older children, and if you want to be comfortable to train older children about being safe in snake country, good. You live in snake country. It's probably a good idea. It's not just going to be your yard. I mean, Utah is an, Utah is an outdoor recreation state. But I think that's just option one. Are, are you comfortable with it? Because more than likely, if there's a rattlesnake in your yard and you do something about removing that snake, it's you're probably going to deal with it again because you probably live somewhere <laughs> where there are snakes. You know, it's just that's probably something to consider. That being said, we have snake re- relocation services. So you can call your local law enforcement agent, your local regional office, and or one of these snake relocation services. Some of our regional offices do do snake removal and relocation particularly the Washington County office, I think. I don't, does your office do it? Informally. Informally. Usually it's, they call me. Yeah. And sure. Or, like or one of our conservation They're like, you're a snake usually, nerd. Please yeah. come move this rattlesnake yeah. from my yard. Or Thank you. Or trained to do it. And, right. Yeah. So you, you can call one of the permitted wildlife professionals that have received a permit from the state or the state. And sure. the state can help put you in contact with some of those individuals in some cases. So when in doubt, if you want it gone, just call Call your the division locust, and say you're seeing it. Now, by the time you call someone, it, is, it might have moved on. Right. So sometimes it's best to just wait and see if the snake moves on. Sure. So these are all the scenarios where you're seeing a snake in your yard and you kind of want done, something done about it now. If you're in one of those scenarios where it's like a common seasonal thing is happening every year, then you have to decide if you want to adjust your landscaping to be less... Uh, comfortable for a snake. Sure. A lot of the people that have regular snake issues in their yard have yards that are attractive to snakes. Right. And some of these things are pe- features that people want in their yard. So, for example, bird feeders. Mm. It's not the bird feed, obviously, bird seed that attracts the snake. It's the birds and the rodents yeah. that are, are attracted by bird seed. So, some of it is your bird seed storage. So, I store mine, and I don't live in a rattlesnake rich area. Unfortunately, I guess, <laughs> for me. Uh, but I store mine in a five-gallon pickle bucket that I got at a, at a, at a burger shop um, and keep it sealed in there. And it's in. It, I know that there's rodents in the shed where I have that bucket, but they don't get in that bucket. They've sure. so far been befuddled by that. There's lots of different storage options that will limit the attractiveness of bird feed and other things to rodents. But then there's also spillover from the bird feeders. So I know in some places people recommend like putting your bird feeder away at night. (laughs) That can be a pretty maintenance heavy move. I'll leave that up to individuals. The main thing is like bird seed attracts both birds and rodents, which can attract snakes if they're in the area. So that's just something you have to assess if that's something you want to deal with. Firewood piles can be very attractive to snakes. As like a hiding, a hiding kind of place. area. Um, so if you're piling wood in the summer, 
you know, you're probably not burning it in the summer. You can just kind of keep your distance from that firewood pile. And, and in the winter, it's probably going to be a non-issue. But also just have a, some situational awareness. Like That's firewood a pile, it's the summer. Sometimes there's rattlesnakes around there. Just kind of like have some situational awareness about the, the place you live. Um, landscaping that I see often along the Wasatch Front and like Logan is where I've seen a lot of it. I'm sure it's in a lot of places, states, but like these rock retaining walls. Right. Oh. They can be very inviting places for, for snakes. So I'm not sure that this is the most accurate term, but like thigmatrophy is the word for organisms that like pressure on their body. They like to be squeezed into a, a space or a crevice, the thigmatrophic. Snakes can be, especially rattlesnakes, can be thigmatrophic. They like to be in little narrow spaces in those rock retaining walls. If your rock retaining wall particularly faces south, it's probably going to attract a snake of some kind at some point. I'm not guaranteeing it's a rattlesnake, but south-facing rocky slopes are just something that snakes really like. Because they, like we talked about earlier, they like to thermoregulate and maintain their body temperature. They south go if you I, I'm, the 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 cinder block wall in my backyard faces south and I've been out there on a 28 degree day where there's no wind and just like put my face yeah. against it and yeah. just, oh my god this is amazing <laughs> how warm this is the sun has like made it like 70 degrees on a 28 degree day right that's why the snakes are there because that's a it's a it's a microclimate it's warmer than the ambient temperature so just be aware if you like rock retaining walls you may very well have created snake habitat in your sure world. sure. That makes sense, yeah. So just be aware of your landscaping, whatever, to see if there's I'm, things. That yeah, I'm not saying snake. nobody should make these choices in their yard. Like that's up to them. But they just they can they they can attract kinds of wildlife. Sure. No, oh, that makes a lot of sense. Nice. Uh, no, we 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 made a note to mention specifically during this item of discussion that the snake deterrent chemicals. Oh yes. Do not work. No. Yeah, cayenne pepper. Store bought. So there's store bought specific ones. Uh, we had there was a snake. Was it last year? I think you sent it the the email in faith about the one in the park <laughs> in Logan. Oh there yes. Was, there was a snake observed in a in a children's playground in Logan. I went up to go look around after it, but the police department called me and said, "Well, we put a bunch of that snake deterrent out." I was like, "Oh yeah. well, I'm sorry." Right? Yeah. I, mean, you know, I don't know. I hope you didn't spend too much on it. But sure. It's, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. Not very effective. Okay. Yeah. No, that's good to note too. Well, you guys are awesome. This has been very informative. I can honestly say I've never talked about snakes this much <laughs> in my life. <laughs> so this has been just a totally new venture for me. But it's been really, really good information. And I think a lot of this stuff is really helpful. And hopefully you guys have learned a lot as well and, and have some things that can help you in the future. And as always, if you haven't yet, we'd love if you could subscribe to The Wild Podcast. We release a new episode on the third Tuesday of each month. So we hope that you will join us next month for some more wildlife stories. 